let's open the Bible to book of Daniel and chapter 3 and verse 6 and whoever does not fall down and worship this statue shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace and verse 16 Shidrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king oh Nebuchadnezzar we have no need to answer you in this matter if this is the case our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand O king but if not let it be known to you O king that we will not serve your gods nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up I'm going to speak today on the topic of transgenderism one of the reasons why is because from the book of Genesis chapter 3 Satan has been assaulting humanity's identity he has said to our first parents if you eat of the tree meaning if you declare independence from God you will be like God meaning you can transition from being a human to being divine that was the first lie and humanity believed that lie Satan tempted Jesus and said are you the son of God if you are the son of God Satan always launches an assault on your identity Christianity is a faith that alters your identity because Christianity is the faith where we identify with Jesus Christ that's why we're called Christians when we are baptized we are buried as Jesus was when we come out of the water we identify with his resurrection there is over 70 references in the New Testament of in Christ in him in him in Christ we're the branch he's divine that means that our identity is Jesus Christ we were made in the image and likeness of God the core of Christian faith is that he died for me I died with him say this with me say he died for me come on I can't hear you in the second section say he died for me and I died with him Paul says Galatians chapter 2 verse 24 I've been crucified see my old life was crucified with Jesus Christ that means my old identity whatever that identity was was crucified with Jesus and in Christ I have new identity he calls me with a new name he gives me new heart he gives me a new eternity because he gives me new identity that's why we we're born again with a new identity that's what the whole Christian faith is and the enemy what he does is he creates a counterfeit and in our culture we see that prevalent today confusion doubt when people don't know who they are anymore when people don't know what love is anymore we live in a culture today that says love is love imagine using the same logic for the water in your house water is water and give your kid a straw to drink from toilet it's water no that logic doesn't work with water yes it's water but everybody here knows and you don't have to be and have a PhD in H2O to know there's a water from the sink probably not a good idea to drink from it there's a water from the fridge that has a filter safe there's a water that's bottled and has little electrolytes added very safe and then there's the water in the toilet now a dog will drink water from a toilet and he will think water is water but you are not a dog unless you've been brainwashed by the culture to believe that you did come from monkeys and therefore you are but my bible makes me to understand you and i were made in the image of god we have dignity we have value every human being whether they're blind deaf crippled whether even if they are physically deformed or mentally not there every human being has a value in the eyes of God and God respects every human being's choice and commands us to respect every human being we're not animals we are made in the image of God when God created us he decided our gender 
you when you were in your mother's womb as an embryo unfortunately God didn't send you a survey and says what gender would you like and I'm glad he didn't because you wouldn't even know what those were God chose that in his goodness he chose you to be a male he chose you to be a female and maybe you grew up and you're like I don't like it you must understand as a Christian we deal with it simply we submit to a good God trust in his good plan and our desires and our mental preferences we submit to his word this is not oppressive because sometimes we don't even know what we like have you ever had moments in your life where you wanted something until you got it some of you have a husband like that you got it like oops I didn't know what I wanted mm-hmm a lot of us have that not in relationships of course we're talking about your friends we're not talking about you right now you made a right decision marrying that person so many people want they want to get what they want until they get what they want and you have to understand as Christians we submit our feelings to our faith our chemistry to our convictions our biology to our theology we're not mastered by our passions we rule our passions the Bible says because we are a spirit we are not our emotions we have emotions but we are not feelers we are believers but see when you're not born again your spirit is dead all you have to lean on is your mind that's unreliable to trust your mind to guide your life is like to trust a blind person to lead you to trust your mind to lead your life is like to trust a toddler to make decisions about your mortgage you can't trust it your mind's supposed to be discipled and trained not trusted that's why the bible says lean not on your understanding but see the idea of what's happening in our culture today the spirit behind the transgenderism really teaches you you have to lean on your mind your mind knows better your thoughts know better you're hurting you're suffering there is a solution do what your mind wants but if you don't have a spirit that's born again that's all you're gonna do and it's not that those people are bad it's just that's what happens when you're spiritually dead we live in a generation today like it happened in the days of Daniel Daniel was in exile and as he was there he was taught in their theology he was taught to deny God he was taught in their pagan ways astrology all of those but David still kept purity of his heart and devotion to Daniel to God and Daniel refused to eat of the delicacies of the king and then we see Daniel and his three boys three friends these three friends refused to bow to the idol that the enemy has set up we live in the enemy occupied territory this is not a pessimistic negative message but it's a realistic message we live in the enemy occupied territory the ruler of this world is still the devil he rules over he's the prince of the air he has principalities and everything established in his culture but we are rebels we are people that cause opposition and I love the fact that they set up a statue and Nebuchadnezzar had some people who wouldn't bow they stood tall they didn't fit in and the enemy is setting up his statue today in our culture and it's this whole idea of woke progressive ideology this statue today is highly exalted the percentage of people that identify as transgender is very small but the idea that people support is extremely high it's extremely sensitive today it provides even maybe some of you you're already getting triggered with the fact that why is pastor talking about that on Sunday morning it's a polit po polit political issue really issue of creation is not political issue of creation is biology issue of creation is our Christian faith 
we believe that God made them male and female that has nothing to do with what's happening in the White House this is what's happening with my Bible it's what's in my Bible in your Bible amen now gender dysphoria is a condition where a person's gender identity does not align with the sex they were assigned at birth causing significant distress and discomfort and it's a, a mental pain that people are experiencing gender dysphoria transgenderism goes further when an individual whose gender identity does not align with the sex that they were assigned at birth person embraces gender dysphoria is there is a struggle but transgenderism is there is no struggle is that there is an embracing of an identity that contradicts your biological sex now in the beginning the bible says god made them female and male or male and female time magazine called transgenderism the next civil rights movement which i believe is a great insult to the people in the united states who were slaves and anticipate the freedom that happened and the moral injustice that was taking place by people enslaving other people based on the race the whole slavery is the idea of it is not biblical because a human being should never be enslaved by another human being and satan wants to enslave us by sin and he wants to use people to enslave other people and that is demonic today in america and i just released a video there's a movie coming out called the sound of freedom today in america there is more slaves in the world today than there has ever been in the history of the world and most of those slaves are children and most of that slavery is human trafficking so if you think that our culture got better because we have cell phones that are smarter than us it doesn't mean it's true we are still deprived we are still depraved we are still people that are corrupt on the inside who enslave other human beings because when you remove the idea of God who teaches us to value another human being you begin to use people instead of loving people slavery is wrong slavery is demonic and we must understand transgenderism is not like next civil rights movement Martin Luther will churn in his grave to hear that insult Bruce Jenner who was married to Kardashian's mom won a gold medal in 1976 was one of the most prominent athletes who publicly came out as transgender also Elliot Page uh, the girl who played June uh, move in movie June when she came out not only she came out but also became a huge spokesman saying times recorded this embracing my trans identity saved me but I want you to notice that a lot of people who come out as transgender and as we heard in a testimony today it doesn't satisfy or fix that thing that they feel inside completely now our culture is going even further as of right now 2023 there is 107 transgender identities they get added I think last year was about 70 or 80 today it's 107 and more are getting added because it's not enough you're always searching for something you're always seeking for something and it's the same thing there's a God-shaped hole that exists there as surgeries and hormones they can fix what is deeply broken on the inside there's a person in Netherlands he's 69 years of age he went to court to change his birth date to be 20 years younger do you know what his argument was and you shouldn't be laughing at this because that's harassment you know what his argument is the same argument that is used by transgender community I identify as a 49 years old what can you say about that and the, the judge says well that's not true it's not fixed in reality he says it doesn't matter about the reality it's real in here now for those of you even maybe who are sitting here and you maybe have a you know support for the transgender community you're like I won't be one but I just understand them it's okay why can't we just let them do that the precedent by which the transgenderism operates if you take that logic into every aspect of society we will have what we have as one person did 
This person had 14 surgeries, spent $200,000 to look like a tiger. And you think $200,000 and 14 surgeries would be enough, but it wasn't because at the end, he still wasn't happy and took his own life. The idea that you can identify with something that's not anchored in reality. I know it sounds cute and it sounds trendy in our culture today, but we must understand there is truth and there is your fantasies. There are facts and there are feelings. There are things that are anchored in reality and there are things that are just floating in the air. If everybody has the right and the government has to support everyone's fantasies and they're not anchored in reality, we will have a world where guys will become tigers. Where somebody who will be 50 years of age will claim to be a 13 year old girl going to a girl's bathroom. We will have that. Then it will lead to men sleeping with children. Why? Because love is love. The rule for this, if we open this can of worms, it will lead our world into self-destruction in the way we will be too late when it hits there. So therefore as Christians, we have to understand. I know the culture is not going to speak up against this. I believe it's a demonic agenda. I'm not against people that are battling with gender dysphoria. We are not against people even who are transgender. We love them. They are welcome as any and every sinner is welcome to the church and receive the gospel and receive Jesus Christ. What we are standing for is the truth is not what you think the truth is. The truth is Jesus says I am the truth. Buddha said, I'm the seeker of truth. Muhammad said, I'm the prophet of truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. Our government cannot change that. Your inner brokenness should not alter that. The truth is outside of you. It is eternal. It is fixed. And we realign our life to that truth. We don't twist the truth to fit our temporary brokenness. This idol that is set up today, this thing that is, there's a demand to worship it. This is focused on this idea that truth doesn't exist anymore. Your truth, my truth, all of us have our own truth. Rachel Dazal, she is U.S. race activist. She claimed that she's black. She identifies as black even though she's Caucasian, which is very insultful. People are not happy in their skin. Some wanting to be animals, some wanting to be opposite sex, some wanting to be black when they're not, some wanting to be younger when they're not. I mean imagine going on a bicycle race on a motorcycle and you claim that you identify as a bicyclist. It's not fair and nobody can say anything. Why? Because they're discriminating against what you feel to be true. We as Christians, our faith rests in facts, not in fallacies, fantasies. Christianity, Christian faith is not discover yourself and chase never-ending cycle of your fantasies. Christian faith is if any man desires to follow after me, let him deny himself. And Jesus says you want to find you, lose you. And every person who discovers their real self, that it happens at the end of their funeral, spiritually speaking. At the end of them denying yourself. And the new age teaches the same thing. Discover yourself. Tap into your inner chi. Realign your chakras. Communicate to the mother nature. Begin to connect your energies. Begin to talk to the universe. And everything is about glorifying yourself. And there is really you become your own God. But the Christian faith is there is a God. It's not, it's not you. This God is good and you are not. You're broken. The Bible says none are righteous. All have fallen short including you and I. And this good God, He's not somewhere distant. 
He sent His Son to die for our bad. He took our bad. He paid for it with His precious blood. Because this good God, not only He is good, He is holy. Which means He doesn't tolerate sin. He punishes it. And He punished that sin in Jesus so God can be forgiving and righteous at the same time. If we would get a God who puts all our sin under the carpet, He will be a corrupt God. But our God is not a corrupt God. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. He's like, man, holy, righteous, trigger words. Trust me, you wouldn't want a God who can be bought. You wouldn't want a God who can be bribed. You wouldn't want a God who can get bullied. You wouldn't want a God who says one thing and then gets moody like Zeus or some of these other Greek gods. Twisted and lustful and vengeful and hateful. Our God, we didn't make Him. He made us. We rebelled against Him and He pursued us and brought us salvation. And all we got to do is renounce the thing that flows in our veins from our enemy called pride. And when we renounce that, that's our biggest problem. Even our sin is not the problem for God to forgive. It's the pride that says, no, I won't. I know better. My way or the highway. I will live my life to prove, to prove. And all of that rebellion drew Satan out of heaven into earth and from earth into hell. And it will do no less to us. It corrupts us even deeper than our sin. But when we strip ourselves from pride, and some of us don't strip ourselves from pride until life hits us straight in our throat. And then we brought down and we say, God, kill me or save me, but I can't continue like this. And then God comes and rescues us because now we're broken. The idol that was set up in Babylon, the Bible says that whoever wouldn't bow to it, would get thrown, not deplatformed, censored, lose their nonprofit nonprofit status. Like they would go to the furnace of fire and they would get killed there. And then these three Hebrew boys who worked for the king, so they worked for the government, when they stood up and they said, We won't bow down, Nebuchadnezzar, their boss, brought them in and says, Hey guys, I understand your Jewish faith and Jewish religion. But I'm going to give you a second chance. While I'm giving you a second chance, I'm going to heat up the furnace seven times more. So threats. I mean, imagine, I, I could, I'm, a sh I'm pretty sure there were more Jewish boys and girls working in that government who simply said, you know what? We're going to believe in God in our hearts. We're just going to bow with our foot, with our knee. But in our heart, we won't be bowing. Because why? I mean, do we really want to irritate our boss? Plus, the guy is pretty moody and cranky. He kills people on spot. Like, if we stay in the courts, we can be a greater witness to the culture that's pagan that we are kind of compromising half and half. And so if we, if we just bow, you know, we'll keep our jobs. But if we don't bow, I mean, it's over just this right here. All you got to do is just go like this, you keep your life. You stand forward, you get burned today into ashes. I mean, your family is going to lose you. I mean, would God really approve of you creating all this mess? Standing up for something so simple. I mean, we know that idol is not real. Like, you don't have to believe it in your heart. Just believe it. Just, just pretend that you believe in your body, but in your heart, just be committed to God. That's how a lot of people live today in this culture demonic agenda wants to bully you into saying something you know it's not true but because we're afraid losing our job being called with names not belong to that crazy group if it's gonna offend people then what's going to happen I will get penalized for that so what I was something that I wanted to encourage you with today is to not bow or be bullied into silence. UK doctor was fired for refusing to use trans pronouns. Intentional refusal to use someone's correct pronouns is equivalent to harassment and violation of one's civil rights. 
That's the National Institutes of Health in the United States. It's already in our law. University of Colorado issued a statement that using a person's pronouns is the most basic need they have to feel safe and exist in public spaces. New York City official state website said this, property owners in the New York City will be fined upwards to $250,000 for using improper pronouns due to new transgender laws. It involves three things. Intentionally fail to use an individual's preferred name, pronoun or title. You can be fined upwards to $250,000. Enforcing dress codes, uniforms, grooming standards that impose different requirements based on sex or gender. Failing to provide employee health benefits that cover gender affirming care or failing to provide reasonable accommodations for individuals undergoing gender transition including medical appointments and recovery whereas such a reasonable accommodations are provided to other employees. So I just want to take a moment and address the issue of pronouns. Today, if you don't use the proper pronouns, you get accused and labeled right away. You actually have a statue against you of harassment. Now, some of you as Christians maybe say, well, Vlad, no need to talk about this stuff, but I do believe that I want to address this issue in this congregation. For those of you, number one, who have maybe children who are battling with this or going through with this to know kind of what can a Christian do? What should a Christian do? And even in the public space, in the public square. Jordan Peterson, who is not a Bible believing Christian, I think he's going to be very soon though. He said, I've studied dictatorship for a very long time, for 40 years. He says, and they all started by people's attempts to control the ideolog ideological and linguistic territory, meaning your language territory. He says, every time dictators came to power, one of the first things they did is they muzzled people's mouth. Or they forced them to say something people didn't believe in their hearts. It's one thing to be told you can't talk about God. It's another thing to be told you should say something you don't agree in your heart is true. Which is for Christians is a lie. Calling people by their pronouns is speaking something you don't believe is true. Respecting somebody doesn't extend to endorsing ideas that are not biblical. For some of you may say, but Vlad, you know, I just want to, I just want to be loving. My Bible, your Bible also tells you that do not rejoice. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Love rejoices in truth, not in tolerance. As Christians, we don't pursue intentional fighting with people that are not of our faith. We avoid purposeful conflict, but don't pursue peace at all costs. Some Christians have become pacifist and they think that you can achieve peace with everyone at all cost. There are people in this world that are broken. There are people in this world that are foolish. And there are people in this world that are evil. You don't get peace with evil people. Evil, you don't negotiate with Hitler. You don't negotiate with terrorists. Now in any way am I connecting these people to what is happening in the transgender community. What I'm saying is this, is that if we live with this view that I'm going to have peace at all costs, it is not a biblical view of peace. The Bible makes it very clear, Romans chapter 12 verse 18. In as much as possible depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Interesting, Paul doesn't say live peacefully. He says as much as it possible, meaning it sometimes will not be possible to be at peace with other people. If somebody comes into your house with a gun and they're not willing to put the gun down and you have a concealed carry and you have a gun, well peace in this situation will only work if you use your peace. <laughs> Somebody's like, well I'm just going to pray for them to be saved. You do that, I'm going to pray for them to be saved on the way as they meet what's going to come out of my shotgun. <laughs> Why? Because they stepped on my house. And if they are bent on evil, evil doesn't stop, evil has to be stopped. And as Christians, peace means this, that we seek peace to the best of our ability. But I like what Martin Luther said, peace if possible, truth at all costs. 
I seek to have peace with people all the time but if that means I give up my right to love Jesus you can take my life or I am not going to give up this truth. Jesus died for me and I'm not going to compromise on him. Don't be a part of deception that leads people into dark path by constantly referring to people by their pronouns. Rosaria Butterfield who's a former professor of English and women's studies in New York University who was an openly lesbian activist and then she encountered Jesus at 1999 and wrote a book about it. Today she's a pastor's wife. She released a blog recently but I'll, I'll give you a little background. Before she released the blog she was speaking at women's men's conferences encouraging parents and other people to not to make a big fuss about the pronouns just kind of address people how they want to be addressed just you know take the bite take the bullet um, go extra mile you know this is not worth standing up for your right or your truth and da, 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 and stuff and recently she released a blog actually just a few months ago and said this why I no longer use transgender pronouns and why you shouldn't either she says why she used the preferred pronouns she says it was a carryover from my gay activist days I wanted to meet everyone where they were and do nothing to provoke insult using transgender pronouns is a sin against the ninth commandment it encourages people to sin against the tenth commandment she said using transgender pronouns is a sin against the creation ordinance it is a sin against image bearing he said she said it discourages believers progressive sanctification and falsifies the gospel she says that it cheapens redemption and it tramples on the blood of Christ it fails to love my neighbor as myself it fails to offer genuine Christian hospitality and instead yields definition of hospitality to liberal progressivism identity politics and human flourishing you know this comes with a broken heart even as I'm sharing this because I do understand I'm not speaking this of just about I've read something or I don't know of anybody we have people in our church who have children who have before they came to Christ were identifying as the opposite gender in fact recently I was talking to one mom and one father who just came to Christ not long ago in our church and they have a son who transitioned to be a female before they came to Jesus Christ they really was doing everything to tolerate to accept they didn't believe in the hearts this was the right decision but they were so afraid to lose the child and they wanted to save the child that they were willing to do whatever that that child would want them to do they bought them makeup they bought him high heels they did everything that they could just make sure that the child does not feel hurt or rejected but you must understand something about that if you cave in to the transgender ideology it doesn't end with them transitioning to the other gender the spiral will continue and they will take you with them and it will never be enough otherwise the transgender ideology wouldn't end in more pain and suffering in even in their mind and something that a person told me in the first service they said being transgender themselves and now coming to Christ they said this when a Christian calls a transgender by their preferred pronoun a transgender knows that the Christian is lying and the transgender knows it's not enough that you call me with the pronoun I want I want you to believe in that pronoun so you calling somebody out of politeness is not enough they see right through you and they also see that you're scared so sooner or later either you go all the way and you change your beliefs or you stand on God's truth and you love a person without compromising the truth so this mother she came after she became a Christian and her father they came to their son and they said something like this I truly want to respect you but I also need to honor my God I believe that God created people as male and female and that gender specifically is the part of his created order I will be as respectful as I can but I'm asking you to also respect my beliefs and my freedom I don't believe that I can refer to you with gender neutral pronouns and be faithful to my God and their son and they said this we gave birth to you as a son we dedicated to you to you as God you to God as a son we gave you that name and that 
never changes. Whatever the thing that you're going through, we're praying for you, we'll always be there for you. But we cannot endorse something we believe biblically and biologically is just not true. And people who come out of that lifestyle, and I've heard countless testimonies already on YouTube, who would go to youth group and people will love them and accept them but not conform to their ideology. When they came to Jesus Christ, one of the things they appreciated about Christians is that Christians had a spine. They, what they believed was true and they were willing to lose politeness in the eyes of the world with respect and say, I believe this is God's, God's word teaches. I love you. I respect you as a human being. But I can't endorse something I know is not true. Three Hebrew boys didn't bow. It cost them their life. But see, God came through. God came in the furnace of fire. God promoted them. And God got a breakthrough. And I want to tell you something that we are believing we're going to see more and more people from homosexual, lesbianists, and transgender community coming to know Jesus Christ. The same way we see drug addicts, the same way we see people from religions, other religions, the same way we see people that are lost in their sin, the same way all of us came to Jesus Christ. And no, God is no respecter for persons. He can take somebody who's been in the deep end of this lifestyle or that lifestyle and bring them to a new life in Jesus Christ. Can somebody of you give God some praise for the power of the cross the power of the blood and the power of the truth of God it changes a sinner like me it changes a sinner like you it is still the same God who is yesterday today and forever the same somebody in the second century say yes you may be seated what I want you to notice is that when they were in Babylon they had to reject the diet of Babylon. Something that I want to highlight right now is that we need to be teaching again more and more in our churches, through our small groups and even our students. In Genesis chapter 18 verse 19 God said to Abraham, for I have known him, speaking of Abraham, in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they may keep the way of the Lord and do righteousness and justice that the Lord might bring to Abraham what he had spoken to him. That means one of the reasons mom and dad, listen very carefully, that God has known you is not only so you will go to heaven, it's so that you will teach your children righteousness and justice. Not greasy grace, whatever goes, nor legalism where if you do this, you doing this, God will not love you. We have to teach God's truth of righteousness and justice. And now we're off into the extremes of legalism or into the extreme of loose kind of godless lifestyle and say all under the umbrella of God just forgives that it doesn't matter what you do repentance is no longer required love of holiness is no longer required because just God just understands and God just loves you the way you are. God loves us the way we are but he doesn't leave us the way we are. He changes us by the power of the truth and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say amen? amen? The Bible says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them. Somebody shout teaching. Teaching them to observe all things. We must understand is that somebody's diet determines their destiny. If you want to change somebody's destiny, you got to change their diet. And so that's why Babylon was seeking to contaminate their diet. And Daniel says, I won't be eating this. I won't be eating this. I believe spiritually it applies that we have to be careful what our children are eating. We have to be careful what we are eating. Some of you are battling with lust only because you are feeding on lust. And if you will disconnect from the lustful source, you will see greater purity in your life and you connect yourself to the source of the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say amen? amen? Same thing with our children. Why am I addressing the issue of children and the young generation? 5% of young adults in the USA, according to Pew Research, say that their gender is different than their sexual, than their, than their sex assigned at birth. 1.6 million Americans now identify as transgender. It's a very small percent of people in the United States. Among adults it's like 1% or something. But among the youth the percentage is greater. What we've been seeing lately is a rapid onset gender dysphoria. Actually they even have a name for this. Rapid onset gender dysphoria. What is this? It's a rise among the girls 
teenage girls who identify as transgender who don't have signs of gender dysphoria as most people who had battles with gender dysphoria in their young age due to few factors one of them it is easier to become popular by coming out as transgender than to win at sports it is easier to become popular today to come out as someone than to be good in school secondly one of the ways that the best way to get back at your parents is to do something that you know they won't like and traditional conservative parents who gave birth to a son or to a daughter nothing hurts them more than when they see their child confused with their gender and that is used as a tactic to rebel against parents it's also being filled with all of the TikTok, with all of the exposure people coming out and sharing their stories sharing their experiences it's causing just more accepted being more accepted and those people who didn't even battle with that who didn't even have the traumas and all of this stuff are beginning to take on this identity just because it's cool what do we do as a church well few, first few things is that we have to bring our kids to church we have to bring God's word to our kids parents it is your job according to God's word to teach your children God's word if you send them to public school and you're like well I want public school to teach them the truth that's not going to happen you have to teach them God's word you have to also they are under your roof you have to be careful how much garbage and what garbage goes into their mouth and into their life you may say oh but they will grow up not knowing trust me it's better I grew up without a TV for about 15 or 14 years of my life yes I thought I missed out because all of my friends had TVs but honestly we had life and we learned how to have life without a screen it was soccer it was planting milking cows and getting chickens and yeah I was on a farm felt like we were poor until I came to the United States and realized to have a farm is actually a wealthy people have farms so I thank my parents and mom and dad thank you for making us grow up in a wealthy home even though we felt I felt like I was poor I want to challenge your parents also when we are going to move into a new building when we have the VS, uh, the uh, VBS children's program summer camps youth conferences there is a lot of money and focus is put into children we are intentional why because our goal isn't to change all the kids in Tri-Cities our goal is right now to build a core of few hundred just filled with the Holy Spirit loving Jesus kids who will go to universities and without losing their faith to a professor that has more degrees than a Fahrenheit and is on fifth divorce who's struggling with himself and starts to confuse our children but that they can go to university without losing their faith but they only go there to get education and then their peers might wear off into all kinds of lifestyles sin is still sin and it will destroy people and once it starts destroying they need a place to come to for rescue and that place has to be here we're playing a long haul yeah our kids are not generation of tomorrow they're generation of now now they're going into schools and evangelizing like we were at the camp right now right now the people from football football teams are in our camps that our kids invited and bringing them to Christ their parents are not Christian but God is going to use this generation to reach the next generation so I want to invite you to pray and fast I want you to I want to invite you don't choose a church and a place to live based on your preference choose it for your children choose it for an environment for your children my pastor always taught me this and our pastor sitting in the second century he said this he says I don't build church for old people he wasn't even old now he's older and this is not offensive for those of you who are older than me you're old it's not offensive because now I'm getting old and there's a lot of gray hair here he said this he says I build a church for kids he says kids will always bring the parents but parents don't always bring the kids and we're seeing that and that's why our church there's a focus on young adults focus on youth and focus on children because we want the world is focused on them this whole agenda is focused on them a lot of them are in that age they're confused they're looking I remember myself going through kind of figuring out who I am and all of this stuff we want to be around that place where it helps them to navigate all of these struggles 
with Jesus in the center, healthy family, spiritual family around if they don't have a physical family so that they can find their anchor in Jesus Christ. Not go and castrate themselves, mutilate themselves and find out that this was a wrong decision but all they needed was a healing from a trauma that they had in their life. But let them go to an encounter, experience that healing, come out with joy, come out with peace, come out speaking in tongues, come out wearing things that glorify Jesus Christ because we will raise for such a time as this our children will possess the gates of our enemies the Bible says in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh your sons and your daughters they will prophesy your sons and your daughters they will dream dreams and they will have visions our generation belongs to Jesus and every parent every grandparent make some noise and give God some praise The person who pushed this idea of gender ideology in the United States who was one of the first scientists and who was the first big researcher his name was John William Money. He's the father of transgender identity. He's a New Zealand Amer American psychiatrist and sexologist. He was also a professor at John Hopkins University. He researched human sexuality and gender. His few conclusions and I will highlight only two and I will mention one person that he did his studies on. His first conclusion was that gender is a learned social construct. So this was in 1921 that he was born. He died at 206. So this was about probably 50 something years of age already idea that he was pushing and he said this that gender was a societal construct malleable from an early age. He emphasized that once gender traits associated with one's public presentation of gender had to be learned. For example, a woman who wears a dress and high heels is publicly displaying a culturally accepted female gender role, which is learned behavior. Gender identity on the other hand illustrates one's internal experience of sexuality. Dr. Money was one of the first scientists to acknowledge that one's biological sex may not correspond with his or her gender identity. Now 50 years ago, this can get you stoned. This was completely revolutionary, which is what made him revolutionary. But people started to embrace because America likes new stuff and we like to kind of venture off into the unknown. And so people started to embrace his ideologies. His second thing that was also revolutionary is positive pedophilia. Money studied pedophilia. In particular, he identified distinction between love-based attraction to children and sadistic pedophilia. Sadistic pedo pedophiles, according to Money, abused and sometimes even killed their victims. But affectional pedophilia, by contrast, was due to eroticized parental love and money emphasized that this type of pedophilia had little to do with sex. Some critics claim that money was tolerant of pedophilia though others have welcomed his research as a better way of understanding inappropriate sexual attractions. Now the case that money used to drive his point home was the case of David Rayner, Raymer. After a butchered circumcision David's parents took him to money. Now David had a sibling brother and money recommended that this boy who just went through traumatic surgery gone wrong to be completely castrated and raised as a girl. This was done. David reported that he never felt like a girl. He eventually married a woman who had her own children and David committed suicide at the age of 38. David eventually reached transition before that at the age of 14 he would fight with dolls, ride trucks and until they tell him, told him at the age of 14 you're actually not a girl, you were born a male and he says it makes sense why I never felt like a female. So this money, Dr. Money's idea that you can condition somebody into a different gender that has nothing to do with your gender is really fraud but it's still being propagated today even though the subject of this study it never worked on him and he committed suicide. Uh, David's brother also overdosed. Now in their family there was a lot of other things that were going on not only this issue. 
what I want to encourage you with today is the Bible teaches us that God created male and female God created and separated heavens and earth for example light and darkness water from the ground animals from humans and then he created two separate human beings males and females when they come together they produce something they cannot do without each other a family men and women are different on the deepest levels of their being our chromosomes are different our brains are different our voices are different our body shapes are different our body strengths are different our reproductive systems are different the design for our bodies are structured and designed to be different and these designs bear witness to differences that reflect God's creative will for the humanity male and female sex organs not only they fit together but they function together their shape their size their fluids their tissue type everything about our anatomy and physiology is meant to work together sex organ is the only body part that requires another human being of an opposite sex to fulfill its ultimate function sperm and egg never actualize their full potential until they unite it's the way God created it it's the way biology works God went further in Leviticus said that men should not act sexually as women Leviticus 11 22. Deuteronomy 22 5 God said men shouldn't dress as women first Corinthians 11 Paul teaches us that men and women should embrace shouldn't be embracing other gendered expressions or it's a disgrace so he would talk about hair he says for a woman it's good to wear hair this way for a man he says it's a disgrace meaning there were certain things that are gender-based expressions that are part of our culture but they really originated in our created design our world is broken it's not the way God created it Romans chapter 8 it tells us that the creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope because of the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now things don't work as they should human are broken our hearts are broken and what we try to do is we try to fix it by ourselves some of us we have to understand we are better at fixing at, at breaking things and fixing them in my family my dad can fix everything in my family I can break everything and sometimes when I break it I know one thing if I broke it I won't fix it because if I try to fix it I break it more so what I do is I call my dad and I said dad I was trying to fix it he's like oh son I already know if you said word fix it I know it's already broken When it comes to the brokenness that people with gender dysphoria, people with homosexual tendencies, people that are maybe been abused, molested, raped. But even if there was no abuse, all of us are broken on the deepest level of us. All of us. None of us are here living how God originally intended us to live. We live in a body that's decaying and dying. We're breathing an air that has more toxins and it's killing us slowly we're eating food that is made today by companies that are far more interested in your in their money than in your health and we all every day every breath you take you're taking one closer to your death God never intended it like that we live in a world where demons feed us with lies we live in a world today where you have to lock your doors because you don't know who can come and steal something God never intended it like that to blame God for the pain and suffering is as wrong as to blame the Minister of Transportation for the accidents on Highway 395. It's humans that break rules and broken rules break our lives. Now what the transgender community wants to offer as a solution is what it's called transition. Transition is when you begin to identify with gender dysphoria, you're struggling with your identity and it's not matching the sex given to you at birth by God. The first step, of course, is to take hormones. Is you take pills, 
that begin to change something in your body you're really fighting against biology and after that of course it's not enough and not many people do it but people do it today is you go under a knife people as young as 14 years of age are getting what we call today in our culture gender affirming help they're getting gender affirming surgeries it's irreversible surgery where perfectly working body parts are being mutilated and removed now something that people don't like to talk about is the stories of people who transitioned into transgenderism and then came and call it they call them detransitioners and they came to Jesus most of them came to Christ and they left that lifestyle there's a survey of 100 of them in fact on March 12th is the detransition awareness day they're trying to sound the alarm that not everything that the community the culture is teaching I believe everything that the culture is teaching is wrong but but they're trying to sound the alarm they say listen there's a lot of stuff that's going on that's being hidden from the media and I'm gonna quote a few things that these people who detransitioned say 40% of participants who detransitioned they used to be trans now they detransition felt pressure from healthcare professionals to medically transition 57% of detransitioners felt their evaluation of gender dysphoria was inadequate 65% of detransitioners reported that possible contributing facts like trauma and other mental health issues were not considered during their gender distress assessment about 45 percent of biological females stated that their mental health did not improve after transitioning meaning the promises they were given they they were not delivered upon 41 percent of detransitioned after realizing their gender dysphoria was caused by something other than their gender identity such as trauma and other mental health diagnosis and 40 percent of biological women reported that detransitioning worsened their mental health as underlying issues were not addressed by the gender clinic or a therapist think with me you have a car in your garage it's not working transition is bad died engine dead and what you decide to do is you take it to a mechanic and mechanic says no problem I will repaint it for you and it'll start working you're like thank you they repaint it you come back you see the new paint the car still doesn't work you come back and he says oh I know I'll repaint the tires you say oh, okay thank you they repaint the tires while they're charging you it's still not working you come back and you say well it's still not working he says and they say well let me repaint the chairs inside they repaint the chairs but it's still not working until you keep painting and repainting but they never address the big issue which is the engine the Bible says the engine of your life is your heart and the Bible says that heart is so sick that it can't be fixed by a surgery by a doctor by religion it has to be fixed by Jesus taking it nailing on the cross and giving you a brand new one your heart is beyond repair that's why it's so broken and it's responsible for all the unhappiness in your life I know we can blame it on the devil I know we can blame it on the society mom and dad even if there are contributing factors for your brokenness like abuse ultimately something you share with me and every human being on this planet including the worst people on this planet is a broken engine called the heart God's remedy is not external behavior modification God's remedy is internal transformation and how he did that is he sent his son Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and Jesus endured agony in the garden of Eden agony is emotional when he was praying his sweat came like drops of blood so he knows what it's like imagine son of God who was never trapped in the body now lived in the body for 33 years human body he was divine perfect self-existent no beginning no end this son of God now experienced betrayal and rejection the human sin he never came in contact with sin as God it was it was against his nature now human sin was placed on him Corinthians it says for he who knew no sin became sin for us 
Maybe you're here today and you struggle with gender dysphoria and you say, you don't know what it's like to experience something that is contrary. I don't. But he knows what it's like to be perfect and carry sin for you. He let his body be broken. He let his body be whipped, beaten, made fun of, scorched. He carried a beam of a hundred pounds tied and then he collapsed under that beam. Most likely breaking everything inside and having internal bleeding. He was tied to a cross, nailed with railroad, railroad uh, spikes in his hands and in his feet. And from nine in the morning until three afternoon, he was there. God rejected him because of that sin that he carried. He experienced all the suffering and all the affliction you can experience. He didn't do it so you, he can sympathize with you. He did it so he can save you. Yes, he knows what it's like to go through suffering. But he also is the only one who can open. If you open the hood, he can replace the engine. And give you new identity. Identity that's anchored and secured, not in a fantasy, but in a historic fact of the cross on the Mount of Golgotha. Only there, your chasing ends. Your fantasies, they go under His Word. And God gives you new mind and new life. And you no longer have to chase the next thing. You rest in Him. And He begins to cleanse you and deliver you sanctify you and make you more like you. Why? Because you were made to be like Him. When He makes you more like Him, He actually makes you more like you. And you will say things like, I've never felt so alive. I've never felt so me even though I denied me and I accepted Him. But when you deny you, you discover true you. That's always been trapped, hidden in Him. Your life is hidden in Him. You will never find your true self without Him. You can get the money, you can get the girls, you can get the drugs, you can get the surgeries. You can try to be a tiger, a parrot. You can try to be younger, older, cuter, do all of that stuff. None of it will fix the engine. Why? Because none of it can go that deep that the work of the cross none of it paid the price for you as he did he loves you so deeply he wants to forgive you today so graciously but he does require one thing is that you repent and believe repent of your sin repent of your pride and believe in the cross in his death for you that he is your god he's not a bad oppressor he is a good liberator the doctor of all doctors, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Hey, thanks for watching this sermon. If this was a blessing to you, would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message? What are you taking home with you from this message? Also, if you enjoyed these messages, would you help us and hit thumbs up to this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.